Hey there, it's Cold Cabana. Thank you so much for checking out the past shows from the archives of the art of wrestling. There have been some ads that have been placed throughout the episode, but if you want to listen to every single episode ever done dating back to 2010, ad free with zero ads, it's only $4 a month on my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Cold Cabana. All right, enjoy the show. This is the art of wrestling with professional wrestler Cold Cabana. All right, how is everybody doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to The Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a life podcast. It's a personal journal. It's an entryway into the minds, the souls, the hearts, and the lives of people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host. My name is Cold Cabana. I am a discounter. I am a couponer for you and for me. I am a presenter. I am a podcaster. I am a holiday spirit entrepreneurial or most importantly though i'm a professional wrestler and i am coming to you live from my studio apartment in chicago illinois before we go any further this is a fan supported and listener supported podcast we give it to you every other thursday for the past six episodes on spotify coltcabana.com google podcasts wherever you listen to your podcast from a couple great ways that you could support rate review and subscribe on itunes tell a friend let them know facebook tiktok twitter however you do it the best way that you could support though right now 25 percent off coltmerch.com also digitalcult.com and patreon.com slash coltcabana where for four dollars a month you can listen to over 10 years of the past archives ad free for an extra dollar on that i got videos special segments acting gigs and so much more and for five dollars on top of that i will give you a shout out at the end of this podcast and i will send you a monthly collector's aow selfie style photo pin you still have time to get this month's which is tomaso champa and the december pin is the infamous photo of myself and dave Meltzer from episode 151 back in june of 2013 But we are here to talk about this week's podcast. It is the last one in the series, a special AEW series. Remember, you can watch AEW every single Wednesday night on TNT, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. And the last one, not, I didn't say, I'm not going to say I saved the best for the last because I think they were all great. I enjoyed doing all these talks. That's why I chose the people that I did, my friends, the ones I have good connections with. And there's something about Tony Schiavone that's just heartwarming. There's something about being a 40-year-old man who was obsessed with professional wrestling. I'm talking about myself here. I was obsessed with professional wrestling, and there was all these heroes that I watched on television that I said to myself, one day I'm going to be in that position, or one day I'm going to be in pro wrestling just like they are, and here I am 20 years deep into professional wrestling, and then I'm working with these people that I watched as a kid, and I can't believe Well, I can believe some of them are real dickheads, but it's the best when the other half are not real dickheads, and that is Tony Schiavone, a non-dickhead, a hero from my childhood who is also a non-dickhead. What a pleasure to have Tony Schiavone on, and I don't think in the talk we gave credit to MLW and Kurt Bauer, but I will give credit because Tony was gone from wrestling for so long, and there was a whole generation of wrestlers and personnel who weren't able to share a locker room with Tony because he was just out of wrestling. And I believe Tony started coming back with MLW and then Tony starts getting involved in wrestling more. And then word gets out from the locker room that this Tony Schiavone, he's the man you want to be around him, a positive person. And that's why it was a pleasure to have Tony on the podcast this week. This is the last in the series. Not sure when we're coming back. I will entice you. To stick on the Patreon, I have good news. I acquired a show that I made, produced, edited basically everything starting about five years ago called Pro Wrestling Fringe. I initially did it for Howl.fm and then Howl was bought out by Stitcher and now Stitcher has been bought out by Sirius XM. I did a show for them so long ago and they've just been sitting on it. I only got some cash up front for the show. I've never gotten any kind of royalties or anything. And I said, hey, can I acquire this back from you, please? And we made a deal. 
And so now I have it. There was four seasons of it. It's called Pro Wrestling Fridge. It's unique stories about the unique world of professional wrestling. It is a narrated storytelling podcast. And on my Patreon at the $5 level, for the next four months, I will be putting out four seasons. And before we move on with the podcast, just to give you a little glimpse in case you've never heard any of it, I'm going to give you an excerpt. I'm going to be playing an excerpt. Is that right? Excerpt. That's a weird word to say. This is from season three, and with the help of Dan Lavransky, I helped tell the story about bears in the world of professional wrestling. Here's a little excerpt. But here's a here's here's a little ex, ex excerpt. Canadian wrestler Dave the Bear Man McKigney, he owned three different bears in his wrestling heyday. Smokey and Spooky were two of them. But one of the most famous wrestling bears on the scene was also property of the Canadian Wild Man, and his name was Terrible Ted. The same Terrible Ted that took a bite out of Furpo Zabisco's finger. He was property of Dave McKigney. And McKigney, he was a true wrestling promoter. He'd use little people, he'd use ladies, he'd use a mixture of burned out legends like the Sheik and worldwide stars of the day like Andre the Giant. He'd promote these small Canadian towns all summer long with his amazing DIY posters that he'd plaster all over town. But McKigney's big drawing tactic was always the wrestling bear. McKigney bought Ted from a rundown, out-of-business sideshow in 1959, fattened him up, and he taught him how to perform. Terrible Ted lived with McKigney, slept under the porch at his house in northern Ontario. And Ted and McKigney would travel all over North America in the 60s and 70s, eventually turning Terrible Ted into a wrestling institution. So that's from season three. So if you're a Patreon, you will be hearing that in February. Starting in December, I will be putting out episodes from season one, which included the story I did about Tom McGee before they found Tom McGee. But now we found Tom McGee, and the world has been changed for the better. Also, it's almost Black Friday. It's almost shopping season. I have never done a sale at ColtMerch.com. Never, never in my life have I done a Black Friday or a holiday season sale. 25% off starting now. It's already happening now through Cyber Monday, use the code Colt25. Because of this pandemic, I have so much stuff. I don't go to shows anymore. I don't sell at the merch table. I mean, that was half my business model, was doing so many shows that I could move so much merch, and now it's just sitting here. So a sale for you, 25% off with the code Colt25. And if you order on Black Friday, I will give you a free Cabanorama headband with any purchase. And if you order on Cyber Monday, I will give you a free Micro Brawler enamel pin with any purchase. So Friday or Monday, get those freebies with any purchase. I've got these new plush dolls that kids will love. Those are 10 bucks, now $7.50. I've got a children's book that you can give to any child for the holidays. Was ten bucks, now seven fifty. I will sign it to any child you would like. This is my last pitch, ColtMerch.com, twenty five percent off before the season ends. With the code Colt twenty five. Here we go. A talk with myself and the ever positive Tony Schiavone. Uh, you are wearing your AEW official polo right do you wear that just in general at all times uh i i wear it uh i wear it when it's the first thing on top of the uh on top of the suitcase okay <laughs> t- t- tell me the difference that's where i'll start with tell me the difference of free swag that you got from the different places that you've worked who was handing out the most who was handing out the littlest i guess the most free swag i ever got was back in the wcw days okay and how did that work hey i need i need a whatever i needed i got <laughs> Uh, because you were the, the the official face of it, or right? Because I, I would wear a lot of the shirts on TV, a lot of the WCW shirts on TV, and I uh, I gave all that to Goodwill too. No, none of that. I was thinking recently because I've been cleaning out my closet, right, uh, and throwing some stuff on eBay, and then I just, just like in my head, I was going to start this thing of like, hey, I bet every wrestler ever. Mm-hmm. Is cleaning out their closet and yeah, and could probably use this cash or something. I don't know, right, you know. Right. And I imagine we all have this wild bulk of stuff. Was there a point of one time where you were just going through it, a bulk of WCW yeah. stuff? They were mostly polos. <laughs> okay, mostly. But we had this this turquoise and purple polo at one time. Yeah, it was the ugliest thing. But at the time when we got it, we thought, "Wow, man, that's beautiful." Mm-hmm. But I went through and I looked at that, and we had a red, white, and black striped polo and uh, a pullover a very nice pullover 
quarter zip polo that was brown with the uh, a an off WCW logo. You know, we had so many different logos. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I had those at one time. So, yeah, I just – and my wife asked me, she said, what do you want to do with those? And we're talking about probably maybe back in 2015 or so when I never thought I would get back into the sport. Yeah. I said, um, I just don't need them. Just don't get rid of them. I don't care. You know? All right. Yeah. Um, so was, was that was there a difference between NWA and WCW giving away stuff? Yeah, NWA didn't have much of anything at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, I mean, it, it was – NWA, Jim Crockett Promotions, was really a, a real mom-and-pop type organization. They had shirts for – I remember they had shirts for the different uh, events like Starcade, Great American Bash. I think I have a Great American Bash shirt somewhere, and I'm not so sure how I got it. But they weren't – they were way behind the times. Uh, as far as merchandising is concerned, when that was that, do they have? They must have had an office. Was it, does that stuff just sit at their office? Or yeah, they had an office. What was their office? Just- there, it's a it was a little. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but it was a little one building office in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, that had a garage, and in the garage they turned it into the studio, and that's where we did our interviews. In that garage, in okay. the studio, because it had one of those garage doors you lift up. The right. Door. <laughs> right. And they were probably legendary interviews. And oh, then, they're the best. And yeah. then if you look from the back, it's just a piece of shit garage. Is that right. what it was? Well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. And who dressed, who's in charge of dressing it up? Because I like the idea if it's mom and pop. <laughs> they, had, uh, they had a couple of guys. They had uh, a guy named Wayne Daniel and a guy named uh, Emerson Lawson. They were both TV guys, so okay. they were in charge of the whole thing. Uh, and uh, Emerson was, was pretty sharp. So they hired him full time, and the studio we had the production truck. They owned a production truck. The production truck set outside the studio. NWA owned a production truck, right? Okay. Um, they and they it set outside the studio, and that's how we recorded into the production truck. Gotcha. Right. Um, okay. So uh, then the oh, so that at the office, who's hanging out at the office? Did you were you a hanger out yes, at the office? Yes, I worked in the. Uh, after uh, after my baseball days were over, I worked in the office. I worked in the office. Sandy Scott and I shared an office. Gene Anderson had an office. Jimmy Crockett had an office. David Crockett had an office. Wow, I remember this vividly now. Dusty Rhodes had an office, and JJ had an office. And uh, I shared that office with Sandy. And then up front, they had this accounting office with like four girls working and their head accountant, a guy named Dave Johnson who oversaw all of them and they had a receptionist and then they had a kitchen. Okay. And that was, that was, that was the thing because we always had meals cooked for us for lunch because Mrs. Crockett always thought her boys, Jimmy, David and Jackie should have a, a, a hot meal for lunch. So she was cooking it. No, she had. They had. They had oh, employed somebody to cook there. Gotcha. Right. So. I like the idea that she came to cook. <laughs> no, no. And then make brownies. <laughs> that, that would sound good, wouldn't it? Yeah. And now, were these guys doing any real work? Like, what is? Well, he, what's your work in the office? And then, like, if the I don't in my head, if the accounts, I get it. Like booking buildings and stuff. But right. Is there a lot of like just have an office to have an office type stuff? <laughs> I I would think I I remember they they brought me in. Uh, I had been doing baseball. They brought me in, uh, and I got basically got paid for just doing my announcing work. Yeah, they brought me in to be like a PR guy, uh, a media relations guy. And I remember I would send out pictures of the wrestlers to all the different buildings, and I would write up press releases and send to the different buildings. Sandy Scott was in charge of booking towns, kind of like uh, I guess Raphael does with AEW. Mm-hmm. And he was in charge of that. Gene Anderson was in charge of local promotions uh, as far as the the interviews that we did uh, on Wednesdays. Uh, he was in charge of making sure that those interviews were done and got into the different markets. markets. Yeah. And uh, Wayne and uh, and Emerson worked in the back at a little uh, place next next to the garage where they worked. And Dusty's creating. And Dusty's creating. He's creating. That's right. <laughs> what year? So what year was that? Uh, it started... I first, uh, I, my first time I ever walked in the office was 83. Oh, God. Yeah. So when you're putting up press releases, mm-hmm. typewriter? Oh, yeah. Typewriter. Typewriter. <laughs> yeah, absolutely typewriter. Not a WordPress. No, no, no. I remember I got my first WordPress. I, it must have been like 89 or 90. Right. right. Do you remember those things? I guess before a computer. Right. It was kind of yeah. a typewriter, but electronic. Right. Uh, yeah. Electronic. Electronic. Had a little, you're talking about the one that had a little uh, 
just a wee little a little window, a little window. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, 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 and right. spacers. Yeah, yeah. But you were doing typewriters. You were in typewriter. Yeah, backspacing and uh, you know, <laughs> good and, type, good typer. <laughs> I thought it was okay. You okay. know, it's funny. I took typing in high school, and I remember my typing teacher told me, you may think it's funny now, but you're going to use what we're learning here more yeah. than any other thing. That, and she's right. Yeah, which is weird because yeah. I vividly remember the only I, – I hate – I did not like school. I, I didn't think – but I really enjoyed uh, – Typing class, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we did it on computers and learning the home keys. And I'm a, a great, I can do it really fast. Right. And like, that's something where it's like, you learn something and it's practical, mm-hmm. as opposed to like beakers and, you know, calculus or whatever, yeah, right. which obviously exactly. we're using in the wrestling exactly. ring, the geometry of the wrestling ring or whatever. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, very practical. Yeah. So I'm glad you paid attention. Yeah, I did. I was, And I'm not the greatest typist in the world, but I'm not a two finger typist. I mean, I, I can type. You can do it. And it, it's funny, my, my, my children, Learned in middle school. That's when I learned. You learned in middle yeah, school. Yeah. Okay, I was. In, this was. I was a junior in high school oh, wow. when I took typing. Yeah, it evolved at one point. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so your job was to send out the, send out the press releases. Press releases, right? Uh, I mean, you, how many were you typing up then? Like, well, if uh, for instance, if we had a show in the Greensboro Coliseum, I would type up the card. Yeah, and I would send the pictures out to the Greensboro Coliseum people. Okay. And that was it. There was one time that um, this was back in 87, I guess, when they were trying to get Barry Windham to do an interview for uh, for Starcade. And I had set it up where Barry was going to do the interview and then he didn't do it. And uh, I got a lot of heat for that because I remember saying, well, Barry should have done it. So, yeah, Barry should have done it. Well, you should have told him I did tell him to do it. You know, and it's one of those things like. So I called Barry and I said, "Barry, you know you're supposed to do this interview." He said, "Well, I, I don't remember you telling me it was a it was a cluster." Mm. So I remember that I was in charge of trying to set up interviews, and it was really small time. I mean, really, really small time, because when I went to work for the uh, WWF in '89, and I set foot in that office, I went, "Whoa!" It's a machine. Huh? <laughs> this is this is how the wor- world really works, right? Yeah, and then. I mean, we we know the world of computers and emails now. Mm-hmm. I always think, just to think back then, when you have to get a hold of these guys, and it's what it's got to be call the hotel and hope you have their right. room because it's not like they have the same phone number. They're in a different right. place every year. Right. Call their wife. Call their girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah. then that's all you knew, so it was probably it, what that's what, that's just the system, right? Right. No right. different. No different. Yeah. Uh, I also like the idea that you got Kendall Wyndham instead. And try to pawn it off as very when that didn't happen. Uh, okay, let's start from everything. Okay. Born. Born? I sure was. Then, <laughs> then steps, <laughs> then food, then a little shit in the diaper. Okay. Uh, are you Atlanta guy? No, I was born in Stanton, Virginia. Okay. How about that? We're out in the middle of nowhere. All right. It's in the Shenandoah Valley. What kind of upbringing? Okay, I was, uh, I was born in Stanton. I lived in a town called Craigsville. Uh, it is very much a uh, right now. It's it's uh, very much in, in in a very small town in the mountains, very impoverished. And uh, back then it wasn't because I had a couple of uh, and there was I was just someone was did a thing on Facebook about the valley where I lived uh, and some of the small towns. Very much back in the day, they were uh, it was a town where that had a lot of industry, a lot of things going on. And since it is kind of it's kind of dried up, is that what your parents were doing? My, my dad was my dad lived. My dad was from uh, Pennsylvania. Okay, he was from a small Italian village called Rosetta, Pennsylvania, and they uh, he worked for the Lehigh Valley Portland Cement Company, and they built a uh, a cement factory down in Craigsville, Virginia, and he got transferred down there, and that's where he met mom, and that's when I was born. Okay, and uh, dad. Mom was 41 and dad was 50 when I was born. So I was very much a, uh, I don't know, midlife crisis baby or a uh, menopausal baby. I don't know right. what it was. I had a sister. My my sister who was actually my half sister. She was, uh, when I was born, she was 18. Oh, wow. So I, I very much grew up an only child. 
in a very, very small town. Do you have a relation? Did you have a relationship with her or was she parental at the time? Uh, yeah. Yeah. She and I, have, and she's, my, my parents have since passed, but she is still alive and uh, we are st- we've been very, very close all the time. Does she act like a parent to you or? Yeah, I yeah. guess as much <laughs> right. as anyone else. Right. 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 My, uh, my dad passed away when I was 16. My mom passed away in 1990. So I was married with children. My mom passed away. Okay. So, but, uh, and then I went from there. I went to James Madison University, which is in Harrisonburg. Uh, stayed in the in the valley in Virginia, but wanted to. Uh, always knew I wanted to leave. Always knew I wanted to leave. Moved out of. Why do uh, you say that? Because I, I just T- TV movies. What is it? it? Anything. I just. I. I didn't. I really. I can remember cold. I can remember one time, and I don't know when it was. It was well. It had to be nineteen. It'd be 1979, 1978. I was at home. I was still going to college, commuting to college. And a friend of mine and I were driving around town, this small little town, doing what you're not supposed to do, driving around drinking beer. Okay? And yeah, back then I feel that was fine. Yes. That's <laughs> exactly. In the 70s, no one <laughs> right. right. We didn't even have seatbelts. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> That's right. So we were driving around drinking beer and... Uh, the song came on uh, New York, New York by Frank Sinatra. And I remember t- he, uh, talking to him. Is my friend Kenny, who still lives there, by the way. He wasn't going anywhere. I told Kenny, I said, man, that song just motivates me. I'm getting the hell out of here. And I just knew I wanted, I knew, I knew I wanted to do baseball. I wanted to, I wanted to be a baseball broadcaster. I knew that from like the fourth, fifth grade. Uh, Did you play sports? Yeah, I played baseball. Okay. Yeah. I played high school baseball. Yeah, but something about you just more said I like announcing it than I like playing it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, uh, I used to. I had a, a a friend of mine who lived across the street from us, and he was blind. And every night during the summer, we would go outside on the porch and listen and tune the radio to different baseball broadcasts that we could pick up. Mm-hmm. And we picked up the ones in Cleveland, uh, 3WE in Cleveland. We picked up WSB in Atlanta with the Braves. We could pick up uh, some of the Yankee broadcasts very, very faintly. Uh, and we picked up uh, WLW out of Cincinnati, Marty Brenneman. And so we just listened to those broadcasts. And I remember thinking, man, that's what I want to do. I want to I want to watch a baseball game and get paid for watching right. a baseball game. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you see the thing that um, Jim Ross and Jensen Karp were a part of where the blind kid was – where the friend of the blind kid, the friend was announcing the wrestling to the blind kid. No. And that's how he watched wrestling. He would go to PWG shows in LA. Wow. Yeah. And then, you know, he wanted to be an announcer. Right. And then Jim Ross came and like surprised him. It was kind of a real a feel good moment. Yeah. That's I'll good. send you the yeah. link to do it. Yeah, please. I, uh, this, this, uh, this blind friend of mine, I have no idea if he's still alive or what. And mm-hmm. I, and I don't know how to get in touch with him. He doesn't have any family members on Facebook and, and no one seems to know where he is, but I'd like to talk to him because, I mean, I did baseball for, well, I guess, combined total of maybe like 18 years. So how long did you do it before you went into wrestling? Uh, I did it from uh, 1981 to 1986, and then I went into wrestling full-time. I was doing wrestling and baseball together okay. for a couple of years, but then I left baseball in 86. So... Did you and I, I feel that's the narrative is that you didn't know much about wrestling or am I? Incorrect? Oh no, I was a big wrestling. You were a big wrestling. Oh, fan. Big I don't time. know why someone that's been said. Yeah, that's that's people making up stuff online. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So I was go on. A big Mid Atlantic Championship wrestling fan, big time. I uh, I spent a lot of money uh, going that I probably didn't have, but I spent when I was in college. I spent a lot of money going to Greensboro, North Carolina to uh, Roanoke, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, seeing Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling was a big fan. And had uh, I had a couple of friends uh, that uh, they, we, would go, uh, we would go on Thanksgiving Day. After Thanksgiving, Mom would fix early Thanksgiving. It took three hours to go to Greensboro. And Thanksgiving was their big, big show. We would go to that. Were you in awe of the announcer, or was it just the wrestling? Like, did that announce... No, I, I, I remember, I do remember sometimes standing up in front of a mirror. It, it's, I mean, it sounds trite, but it's a true story. Standing up in front of a mirror and, you know, pretending I was interviewing these guys okay. back and forth. I remember doing that. But I never thought that, I never had any, I just loved it. I, I loved, loved the theatrics. I loved, uh, 
I love just going to the matches and, you know, you'd make friends with people at the matches right? and uh, you'd, you'd all get to know each other. And I would set basically the same place every time in Greensboro, try to get the tickets. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's funny, the tickets would get mailed to me, you know, I mean, and then they would, they, at, at intermission, they would say the next mid Atlantic championship wrestling card at the Greensboro Coliseum is Monday, May 27th Memorial day. And I would say, oh, shit, we're going to buy those. Mm-hmm. And so we would buy tickets and go. And so, yeah, I, I, I loved I loved. And that's when when I when I got the job, my second job in baseball was with the Charlotte team. And they were owned by the Crockett's. OK. And I very much knew who I was being employed by. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you start like politicking? Oh, my God. All the time. So tell me how that works. OK. I I started politicking <laughs> at a necessity. Because the most I ever made in baseball was $12,000 a year. And uh, Lois and I had been married. We just had a, a child. Uh, and we had, just, and we had a, another daughter on the way, another child on the way. And you were and, living in Charlotte now? Yes, living in Charlotte. Okay. Really needed the money. And I would tell Frances Crockett, who's the sister of Jimmy, David, and, and Jackie, and she ran the baseball team, I would, I would say, Frances, I'm an announcer, and if you guys ever need an announcer... I can do it. Mm-hmm. And she said, okay, you know, you got plenty you got to do with it. And she really wanted to separate baseball and wrestling. She really did. But it was really very difficult to do. So I politicked a lot. And she was your in. What's that? She was your in. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So one day, and this, this was in, in 1983, uh, Lois was pregnant with Laurie. And late in 83, she said, uh, okay, got something for you if you really want to do it. I said, what? What are you talking about? She said, I, they need somebody to interview Ric Flair for his uh, match with Harley Race called a Flair for the Gold. It's a big thing they're going to do in Greensboro. They want to get another announcer on TV, and they'd like you to go to Ric Flair's house and interview him. I went, oh. <laughs> I mean, when I really, yeah. literally could not sleep that night. Yeah. I was so excited. What a, what, a, what a good draw to get your first one. Exactly. So I I went and did it. I got to meet Flair. He was really complimentary of what how I was work with him and and uh, did they say that they they couldn't find anybody else or no they didn't say it they just said they wanted to <laughs> were you in in line for this okay. weird spot yeah apparently I was because okay. what happened was was and I can't remember the day it had to be just a couple of days later Frances called me into her office again and she said okay I knew this would happen. <laughs> She said, but they also want to use you to do local interviews. Because you were good. I guess I was. Yeah. Okay. I was a diff- I was different. Okay. Okay. I, I'll tell you another story, too, that, that makes me think I was different. So they had a guy named Big Bill Ward who had been there for years. I think Bill was in his 80s or something. So, he, so Big Bill Ward had been doing wrestling since it was like black and white TVs. Old. So, so Bill and I basically alternated doing things until they worked me in and then they got rid of Bill. And I started doing the interviews, and that's how I, I learned. That's how I started the business. Just you know, Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling is coming to Greensboro, run down the card, bring in a heel, go to another uh, backdrop, and bring in a baby face. Would Bill Ward give you a sob story, like knowing you were taking his job? No, no, he's, no, he's he's a classy guy. He was he ready to go anytime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and okay. Is he was he a he was a legend? Yes. Uh, a TV legend in, in Charlotte. Okay. Yeah. Big Bill Ward had been doing wrestling in Charlotte forever. And were you a bit in awe? And w- did they take up a mentorship with him or anything? Uh, no, I, I wasn't in awe of Big Bill Ward. I was in awe of Bob Cottle. I started working with him, and that's who I was in awe of. Mm-hmm. But Big Bill Ward was more like a local guy in Charlotte doing wrestling. And was he big? Yeah. Okay. I mean, he wasn't as big as he used to be, but he, yeah. was, he was big at one time. Okay. I mean, he had worked for... Uh, the the senior Crockett, you know, their father who had yeah. since passed away. Yeah. And, uh, and so then they worked me into doing that. And then they asked me if I wanted to do commentary a little bit. And I did. And I remember we were in Shelby, North Carolina. Is this the story that you were different? You knew you were different? Yeah. Okay. Shelby, North Carolina. And I did commentary for a match and I went in the backstage area and Ricky Steamboat said to me, he said, I, he said, you made me want to listen. Wow. He said, I, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm watching, and now I'm listening to the commentary. He said, "In in the because they would have a monitor in the back," and and he said, "Before it was just noise." He said, "But you you made me want to listen." I, he said, "So you're really good." I said, "I appreciate that, Rick. I don't know if I'm really good, 
I just know that I'm different. Okay. I have a different voice that you hadn't heard in a long time. Right. right. What a compliment, though. Yeah, it was. It really was. And do you think it was just because you're a different voice? Or like, what twang do you think you put on it that they that made you different, I guess? I don't know. I, I was genuinely, genuinely, I always thought, excited about what I was watching. Okay. And I think that came across. I don't, I don't, I don't think that my excitement for wrestling was, uh, was fake or, or, you know, I, I just, I loved what I was watching mm-hmm. and I felt, I felt very much a part of it. I, I felt like I was accepted into this, you know, this brethren, this organization. I, the first day, which, uh, is a day that I'll never forget in my life. After Francis told me, she said, okay, they, they, I knew this would happen, but they want to use you. So I went down, uh, it was probably the next day, I went down, I met with Jimmy Crockett in his office, and Jimmy told me, I'm not so sure the words he used, but he said, basically, what you see and what we do here at this office stays in this office. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, I got it. You know, thinking, aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, aha. Was that, was that of any surprise to you, though? Well, you know, I mean, as a wrestling fan, there was, there was always a hook yeah. back in the day. There was all you would see, like you go to a, see seven matches on a card, right? And you'd, you'd look, you say, "Well, the five of them are bullshit." But then you watch one match, and think, that's real, yeah. And that was the hook. Yeah, Magnum TA and I talked about that a lot because Magnum was from Virginia too. He was from Norfolk, and he watched Mid Atlantic Championship Wrestling when he was growing up. So, I, uh, so Jimmy had Gene. He brought Gene Anderson in first time I met Gene, and I, I knew Gene Anderson was the Anderson brothers. He said, "Gene, take him in, and let him work in some interviews." And Colt, I walked into the back, into that garage area, and they had double doors that separated a couple of rooms. Where they had partitioned off the garage, big garage. And when I when he opened up that double doors, and I walked in there, that was the change in my life right there because there was Steamboat and Flair powing with each other, mm-hmm. Greg Valentine, Roddy Piper was there. I mean, all these guys who I knew who had been in these feuds, yeah, were all friends. Yeah, and I went ah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stuff that we take for granted now, right. which we'll see in every locker room. Right. right. But, but the, the right. second that it happens for someone. It, it, it was like, wow, yeah. man. I, I know all these guys. And they were so nice to me and so accepting. Everybody was just so nice to me. Even Ole Anderson, as miserable <laughs> prick as he could be. I was going to say, <laughs> notorious. <laughs> right. Was very, very nice to me. And, uh, they, and I felt accepted. So that's why when I did, a, when I did commentary, my, I thought my my excitement was genuine because mm-hmm. I loved what I was doing. I was genuinely excited about matches because I used to be excited about them as a fan, and so I, I think that's what uh, what brought me in. So, uh, okay, so I, I, had a, I, have a, I have a couple questions, but I, so who, let's say who was there? Someone that you started working with on promos who wasn't that good, and then maybe you helped, or eventually you watched them get like really good, and it was really exciting wow, and gratifying that, for you. I, I don't that that's hard to say. There was. I thought everybody was pretty damn good. I mean, everybody had their own their own thing. I mean, I can remember doing interviews with Jimmy Valiant, where he would kiss me yeah. and walk away. Magnum TA was serious. Dusty and Rick, of course, were the best. Tully and JJ. You know, JJ was there wasn't anything dynamic about JJ, but he was he did a good job of getting the point over, trying to sell the point. Uh, Arn Anderson was tremendous. The, if, there's so many times like I'll watch like old Memphis TV and you just see the guys that they're starting off in Memphis and they're just like you could tell how especially as a wrestler who's been around you could tell how green they are right and then you see them years later and right like, you know one example I will give is like a uh, big boss man mm-hmm. I watched some of his NWA stuff and he right. wasn't that good no and then right. you see those boss man promos are so amazing right. yeah so that, I didn't know if there was any people you saw maybe coming in who you got right. to watch grow over the years well I I, I never thought Don Cronodo and, and his brother Rocky Cronodo uh, were the best yeah and, and and I saw them get a little bit better as, as they as they went through and a lot of times, just the emotion of what they were doing would, would drive them to get better because, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of truth to old school guys, you know, beating the shit out of each other. Mm. And uh, Steamboat, te- Steamboat tells a story, which I think is great, about a- an angle that I, that I – and, of course, you know, Ricky Steamboat is probably one who is very much a mild-mannered, you know, baby face type, you know – polite young man mm. from Hawaii that as he moved on through time and had battles with Ric Flair and 
you know, had some of the that was had a little bit more fire to his right to what he was doing. I mean, he became the dragon, right? And instead of Ricky Steamboat, so he tells a story which I think is a great story. It's one of the it's one of the funny stories because I remember the I remember the interview. He and Flair on, and I don't know when it was, but I know it was a fan back then. He and Flair had this great run, and there was a time where uh, Flair took his face, took Steamboat's face, and rubbed it around the floor of the TV studio, mm-hmm. you know, just beating him up and rubbing it around. And Steamboat came out, and he was all swollen and everything, had a towel kind of over his head. I remember the interview. Well, what really happened was Flair rubbed his face and it, they went to the backstage area, and Harley Race, they were getting ready to do another episode, and Harley Race said, that doesn't look good enough. Mm-hmm. So Harley had sandpaper. I don't know how he got mm-hmm. the sandpaper. Of course okay. he's got sandpaper. Because, <laughs> and it, he sandpapered off his eyebrow, and he pulled Steamboat's head back and went, bam, yeah, yeah. and him as hard as he could right there, okay, yeah. and made it swell up. And that's the old school shit that, that, you know, that people that we don't see now that, I mean, like Harley Race was legitimately, you know, a badass. Mm-hmm. And uh, a good guy. I mean, they ever got cold. Everybody was a right. Good guy. You just don't. Yeah, you knew what they could be. Yes, right? exactly right. Yeah. And so I felt I was part of them. I felt I was a part of the brethren now. And I and I really, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't stooge off anything. Didn't call the dirt sheets. <laughs> didn't do anything like that. I respected the business because that's what Jimmy Crockett told me to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, and uh, and then in '85 he 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 had a meeting with Vince McMahon, and I remember. I remember David Crockett saying, uh, and I was in the office, David said, Jimmy's been meeting with Vince all day. I think we're going to get the TBS time slot. And uh, and this was April of 85 or maybe the end of March of 85. And Jimmy came back that day and he said, uh, you got a decision to make. To you? Yeah. Okay. He said, I want you to do be the one of the commentators, you and David, do the commentator because we're going to take the TBS 605 time slot. He said, I'll give you a day or so. He said, but it's probably going to mean you're going to have to give up baseball. Oh, you're still doing baseball. I'm still doing baseball. Right. So I said, okay. And so I, I talked to Francis, and they let me do baseball for another year and a half. And then at the end of the 86 season, uh, that was it. Well, I guess it's kind of interesting because you you grew up wanting to do baseball. You're right. doing it. Right. But you said you only made twelve grand. This is paying a little bit more, right? Yes, and yeah. you still love wrestling. Oh yeah. So was it a, a hard, hard decision, or was yeah. it? It was hard. Yeah, it was hard. Well, it wasn't a hard, hard decision. Yeah, it was hard. Okay, it was hard leaving baseball because another crazy story was Lois and I were we had two children, or do we have one? I think we had we had one. We're living in this house in Charlotte, and we really, we couldn't even afford really to pay the deposit for a natural gas to heat the house. Mm-hmm. So we had space heaters. And we were really living day to day. And uh, I, I had told David, I said, I, uh, I want to, uh, and this one I was, I, would just, I had just started out with him. And I said, uh, I want to come to the show. And he said, sure, I'll get you a ticket to come to the show. So I went to the show and sit down in the crowd, Okay. And David came out. I remember David walking out of the locker room in Charlotte Coliseum, and he was looking up near me. He was looking around. I'm thinking, he's looking for me for some reason. I went down. He said, our C.J. Underwood, who's our ring announcer, didn't show up. He said, will you do the ring announce? I said, I'm not dressed. He said, it's okay. You don't have to get in the ring. So I did the ring announcing, okay? And after it was over, he gave me a $100 bill. Mm-hmm. That $100 bill was a was a... a a means of celebration for Lois and I. I brought, I'll never forget it. I brought, I said, look what I got, a hundred dollar bill. And I realized, hell, a hundred dollar bill, you know, for just going out and doing ring announcing, I realized there was more money in wrestling yeah. than there was in baseball. But that whole thing of wrestling and career success or whatever you say to yourself, right. was there a little bit of like, not, I don't want to say failure, but realizing that the dream you had, yeah. You know, because we're all, a lot of us are in wrestling, and it's like our dream, and it's so crazy that we're fulfilling our dream. Right. But the first dream was baseball. Right. Uh, it, that's why I think the heart, like, not necessarily, yeah, monetarily it makes sense. Yes. But was there a piece of your heart that was oh, like, yeah. this was my, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that that there was a piece of me that said, well, you'll never make it to the big leagues anyway. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it must have been. Because you did Atlanta Braves baseball. I, well, what happened was when uh, when WCW went down, 
I started working for WSB Radio in Atlanta, and they had the Braves broadcast contract. They had the they were the rights holders, so they had me do. I was one of three guys that did the pregame and the postgame show for the Atlanta Braves. Okay, so I was back doing baseball, and but I was just doing pre and postgame show. wasn't But I got to know the broadcasters, got to go to the games, got to know the players. So I was kind of in baseball, mm-hmm. but not working for the Atlanta Braves. And then the Braves moved their uh, AAA team from Richmond, Virginia to Gwinnett County, which is right outside of Atlanta. I knew the general manager of the, uh, of the uh, Richmond Braves. I knew him because when I worked in Charlotte, he was general manager of the Greenville Braves, the Braves AA team. So I called him one day because I had also been doing official scoring for the Braves. I was, I was like the third official scorer. They had two main official scorers who alternated games. When one of those guys had a conflict, they would call me. Mm-hmm. One year I did like 15 home games. So I called him and I, and I said, Bruce, as Bruce Baldwin was his name, is his name. I said, Bruce, so when the Richmond Braves come to uh, Gwinnett County, I got an idea. Let me be your official score. He said, I've got a better idea. Why don't you be my radio announcer? And that's how I became the Gwinnett radio announcer. Gotcha. Didn't, even, didn't even apply for the job. I just got over the phone like Perfect. that. And so the, the, the radio station that I worked for full-time, WSB, the people were great people, enabled me to do the Gwinnett Braves while I was working for WSB. And it was a little bit of a challenge because mm-hmm. I had to do morning sports in the hotel room, wherever we were. Uh, and uh, Did you ever call a, an Atlanta Braves game? Yeah, uh, I, I called four Atlanta Braves games in spring training. Okay, but no, but none of the regular season. But that must have, was that like the moment of like yeah that was that was the great of moment. pride yeah of yeah, course it had sure. to have been yeah that was a great moment yeah that's cool because I look with, I work with Leo Mazzoni who was their longtime pitching coach and he was like my color guy mm. and it was yeah it was that was pretty cool yeah that's weird I mean this is a wrestling podcast but. In the baseball commentary podcast, mm-hmm. that's like the movie moment, right? Right, when exactly. You get to, all those years taking the break, then exactly. coming back. Yeah. Uh, okay, so my question was, you said Bob Cottle. Yeah. And so I, I was actually talking to Jim Ross the other day about Gordon Soley, because I remember him doing yeah. WCW stuff when I was a kid, right. very briefly. Yes. Uh, so And then I, maybe Jim, too, for you? I don't know. Like, Who were the legends that were around well, uh, Gordon Soley, I had I had a chance to work with Gordon a little bit. Okay. Well, he and I did worldwide wrestling for maybe like three or four months. I don't know what happened. And are you in awe of him or are you like, yeah. oh, this guy's so drunk? Or no, like, no, no, no. <laughs> he, yeah, he was he was different. I was I was in awe of him uh, because I everybody knew who Gordon Soley was. I didn't really know much about JR because that was Mid-South Wrestling mm-hmm. and that was not the territories. That, but Bob Cottle was the man. I mean, and not only Bob Cottle was a man and... And Jim Ross, anybody who ever worked with him would tell you he was one of the one of the greatest men ever. He was just a humble, nice person, and I, I I was really excited about working with him. I did get a chance to work with Lance Russell, and I didn't know much about Lance Russell, but I got to watch some of his stuff after I started working with him, and I thought, wow, he's tremendous. And as he was doing it, were you? Yes, I like the idea of you don't really know him, and he's doing it, and you're like, Jesus, this guy's unreal, right? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, okay, right. And then was there anyone who really like? Do you ha- do you ha- would you say you have a mentor or anything, or is it just a lot of guys around a situation that a mentor? Wow, uh, yeah, I guess Dusty Rhodes was my mentor, okay, because he was he was a booker back then, and he liked me, and he used me, and he. He would, he would tell me, he said, you know, he said, there's some subtle things that you do that other announcers don't. And he said, and it, it tells me that you get it. And one of the subtle things I would always do would I try to slowly, without it being seen, ease my way out of the camera shot. Hmm. If I was in a camera shot and Ric Flair was talking and I looked over the monitor I saw in the camera shot, I would ease back because I knew that they wanted to see them and didn't want to see They didn't want to see your shoulder and right <laughs> arm. <laughs> Just see that arm. I was, I was, I was, the, I was the greatest microphone stand yeah. ever, man. That's what people say. Love those interviews you did with Ric Flair back in the 80s. I didn't interview Ric Flair. I just said, here's Ric Flair. Yeah. That's all I yeah. did. That wasn't an interview. Would, would you get... Would you get goosebumps during those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. imagine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it wore off afterwards because I started traveling with them, and I realized that. But I only, I, I mean, in the because you you watch those Flair and those Dusty promos, uh-huh. and you just see how fucking riled up they get. Oh, yeah. 
And I'd, I'd imagine it comes to a point where even if they are your buddies, where they yeah. get so into it, oh yeah, that you start feeling yes jazzed yeah. up. Abs- I mean, there were many times I can't point out one, but I do know there were many times that I was holding a microphone, thinking we're in the midst of something good here. Yeah, you know, we are. We are. That's really- the best when you could yes, tell, huh? Exactly. And then, wow, I, there, I don't, I don't expect you to have situations, yeah. but I would love to know if there were times where you're like, we're in something good, and then. It didn't translate on television. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I, I can tell you one interview that I did when I knew we were in the midst of something good. Uh, and these were local promos uh, before he went and made a big name for himself in the WWF. Roddy Piper worked for Jim Crockett Promotions. And he and Greg Valentine had a great run, which culminated in that dog collar match mm-hmm. at Starcade. And they did a lot of interviews about the dog collar match. And Piper was so inventive and so creative on these interviews. One interview, he put the dog collar on me as he's talking. He's putting the dog collar on me, and I'm holding the microphone. And and then he takes, and he's dragging me around. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do to Valentine. And I'm thinking, man, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And it was over. He said, are you okay? I didn't hurt you. That's no, man, I, I love doing this kind of stuff. What what Were you involved in, like, I guess, were you involved in angles and stuff? No. Uh-uh. Never in your whole well, career. Vince Russo had me in, had me involved in it. Wanted me involved in angle with Tank Abbott. Okay, and I told him I said, "Listen, I'll do anything you want, Vince. You know that." But Tank Abbott's nuts, which he was. Mm-hmm. And he said, "The only thing I'm going to have him do is hit you." I said, "I don't think so." Yeah. So so they had a thing to where uh, uh, Tank dropped down, and I had two of my young sons at ringside. One was Johnny, and they dropped down, and he approached Johnny, and I jumped up. What's he trying to do? And that was, and I, I can't remember. I didn't run over towards Tank because I'm thinking, mm. but if I'm getting near him, he's going to, you know, clip me. So uh, I guess we got Doug Dellinger in there in the middle of it, and uh, and then I did that, did that thing which I just watched. I did that thing on the which was my one and only uh, appearance on TNA, which is in January of '03 when I came out with chains on and turned heel and shit on Mike Tanay. Okay, yeah, and did that. And that was that was that night was the moment that I realized that I had had enough of wrestling. Did you wrestle? No, I just I I, I was going to be I was going to become the heel announcer is what I was going to do. Okay. Become. And I came out did a promo on Mike Tanay. He came in the ring and we went face to face. And Russo came out and he said, "Tony, he said, you got a family in the back. They love you. We know you've been you've been shafted by pro wrestling because it had been oh three. So I've been out of wrestling two years." Mm-hmm. And the story was that nobody wanted Tony, which was true. Nobody wanted Tony, and uh, Tony was pissed off. So Vince Russo brought me in the back, and I was going to do all the heel interviews. And as we're driving back to Atlanta from Nashville, I tell Vince Russo, I say, I, I, I can't do it anymore. I said, I, I want to I'm, – I'm doing baseball now, right, with the Braves, and I'm doing the pregame, postgame show. I really like what I'm doing. I just want to try to reinvent myself. So that was, and I was going to be a heel then. And I remember uh, Conrad read to me the what uh, Wade Keller said and said that Shivani didn't want to do it because he didn't want to turn heel. That wasn't true. I didn't care about turning heel. I just didn't want to do it. Right. Yeah, I just, I just, because what happened was I drove all night from Nashville. It's three and a half hour drive to Atlanta from Nashville to Atlanta and went right to the radio station yeah. and did the morning shift. You paid enough of your dues at this point, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a twenty-year-old's job, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, something interesting you said is that I, I thought that no one wanted you. Yeah. You said no one. Well, I say that because I when when WCW went down, I really tried to get get on with the WWE, which yeah. was was kind of uh, I'm calling them WWE now, which <laughs> which is kind of weird because my wife absolutely said uh, she said. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to hire you. I don't know if that's going to work out. But we're not moving. I'm not going. I'm, we're not moving these kids. We had five kids. We're not moving these kids again. We just and we're we've been in Connecticut. We were there for one year. She said, "Well, I just don't want to move." So I knew that if I was hired by Vince, that was going to be an argument that was going to come along. But Vince, they never returned my phone calls. And I called Kevin Dunn. I called Vince. Never returned my phone calls. Uh, but I didn't try to get on with TNA. I was going to say you. you, you so by no one wanting you in wrestling, you tried one guy and one guy. You, you were like, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, I, there, I, there must, I guess TNA was the only thing. Well, TNA was the only other thing going on. And right. Russo was the one of one of me because Vince and I had, have always been friendly and he wanted me to uh, come work with him. 
And, you know, I hemmed and hauled and finally agreed to do that thing, thinking him thinking that I would, you know, was going to do it with him full time. And uh, I got three hundred dollars for that night, which was OK. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, it done. Tell me. Tell me about being on Nitro. Yeah. Well, I don't know, because I, I'd love to know where in your head you rank these things of like, oh, this is amazing. Is it do you because you were doing NWA and you were the, basically the face. So like is being on Monday Night TNT for you? Is this like I'm like a new there's a like a new star of me or yeah. was it just work as, as it was usual? work as just work as yeah. usual yeah. To, to me? What to me? What was the thing that? What would you mark out for? <laughs> As, uh, for yourself? For, for yourself, yeah. doing TBS 605 the first time. Gotcha. 1985. Yeah. Yeah, because they had seen Gordon Sully for all those years, and then they took him off and they put the reruns of the uh, the tape matches for the WWF on, mm. right? And then all of a sudden, you just tune in one day unannounced, and there I'm standing there with David Crockett. And uh, I had watched as a fan 605. Yeah, we could pick up TBS. You know, right. So I had watched that, and I knew how big it was. Mm-hmm. And you know, I got to meet a lot of new people. I got to meet the Road Warriors. I got to meet some of the people from Georgia Championship Wrestling, and uh, that was a big moment for me. But Nitro was just, you know, the Nitro. Me being on Nitro was kind of like one of those things where they made a decision. Eric made a decision to turn himself heel because he was a Nitro guy. Mm-hmm. And so when he turned himself heel, they moved me into being. I remember Eric saying, "If I'm going to play this heel part, I can't be an announcer. So you're going to have to do it." And you're like, "Yes, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> you you need to play this full yeah, for right, exactly. Yeah. What were you doing before? Just the the syndicated shows? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, but that's a big move. But again, yeah. you, you just were. It was a big move, but you know, once once Nitro came out, everything else went. Mm-hmm. Everything else didn't mean anything, right? And that's where that's where my job behind the scenes was even more important. Because I had to try to make those shows. They, we still tape for those shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jimmy uh, Jimmy Hart and I talk about this a lot when we talk. Jimmy says, you know, the only people that cared about it, baby, about Saturday night after Nitro was you and me. And then we would, they would go out and do Saturday night tapings. And it would be me and Jimmy Hart in charge. Yeah, I always heard that Jimmy yeah. Hart booked those. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, me and Jimmy Hart. And uh, Arn Anderson was there. Kevin Sullivan was there as agents. And, you know, there was never like, there was never like a Hogan or a, or a Scott Hall or a Kevin Nash or any of the big sting or any of the big stars. Yeah. So we took pride in that show. Mm -hmm. And I took pride in not only making Jimmy, you know, coming up with the matches, because they didn't care. Uh, Jimmy coming up with the matches, I took pride in making sure that whatever storylines were on, on Monday were also, you know, Kept the storyline going on Saturday as far right, as because no one else was going to no one else no one else cared about it. At all. No one else, yeah. It's the, that's the truth of wrestling, isn't it? Exactly. And you know we got uh, we got in the uh, I thought I turned that off. Sorry, yeah, it's okay. Uh, we got in the uh, we started doing the shows in Disney. Yeah, and Disney or Universal? We started Disney. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you remember the it was a famous the the fame we we were so in with Disney. And it just so happened that we started with Disney, and uh, Disney uh, also was going to be the home of the Atlanta Braves spring training. So it was kind of like Turner Broadcasting mm-hmm. and Disney working together. Yeah, I remember you made uh, Dale Torborg Jr. Mickey Mouse. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's the Kiss Demon after that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, okay, so, okay, let me think about this for a second. Why not? So we, we, we got... There are some shows out there that look great. We we did some shows at the uh, the New York City street scene at MGM Studios, which is now Hollywood Studios. We did some uh, some of our wrestling there, and they look good. It really really looked good. We did we had two syndicated shows worldwide NWA Pro, or do, became WCW Pro. Uh, we had two shows there, and we went out and did a Nitro at the front gate of the MGM studios. Mm. It was, I mean, if I stop and think about that, that that's pretty special. Mm-hmm. That's pretty spectacular. And of course we screwed it up as only we could do. Yeah. Who's taking credit for that? Uh, I, I don't, I guess, I don't know who's taking, I guess who was booking Kevin Sullivan was booking back then. Maybe Eric Bischoff. Well, here's how we screwed it up was, yeah, I was going to say, I thought, I'd assume it was one of the boys, 
punched well, yes. someone playing Pluto or something. No, it's almost like that. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like that. It's We had this angle where Kevin Nash, NWO taking over, right? Kevin Nash came out, he took Rey Mysterio and threw him into the one of the Infamous, trailers. Yes. Yeah, like a lawn dart, mm-hmm. a lawn dart thing. Boom, okay. The NWO is taking off in a... Uh, in a limousine, and the macho man jumps on the hood of the limousine. The limousine is driving out. You know, police come. You know, uh, EMTs come because we had set it up. You know, mm-hmm. because Ray's hurt, right? They're hurting everybody. Well, Disney looked at that and said, "We don't, we don't want that." You know, this is the family thing. We don't want people coming into the MGM studios and seeing, right? Uh, you know, guys fighting and seeing. Uh, being taken out by uh, rescue squads, ambulance, or whatever. Also, so, the hottest wrestling was, and it tells you, no matter how hot wrestling is, Disney is so much bigger that that was like a little blip. Like, oh, get rid of that, exactly, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. I, I guess anything, I, I guess we'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the what was it, like a year with WWF or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is there anything? Oh, it was great. It was... Uh, until uh, what happened to me recently, it was the greatest r- year of my life. You loved it, though. Oh, loved it. Yeah, yeah. That, that was that was one of those fork in the road turning points in your career type moments, because uh, a year later, WCW wanted me to come back, mm-hmm. and I knew I loved working for Vince. I loved doing Coliseum videos, and Vince kind of was hot and cold on my announcing, like I did SummerSlam, but then I didn't do the Survivor Series. Then I did, uh, then I did the Royal Rumble, but I wasn't going to do WrestleMania, and it was like Bruce Burcher would say, "Well, Vince is he thinks you're too Southern," mm. and then he Bruce Bruce come back and he said, "Bob, Vince thinks you're getting better." And I, you know, <laughs> just I don't I don't know I don't know if they were screwing around with me or not, did, but I, I liked it. Did your the way that that screws with a lot of people's head? Did mm-hmm. that screw with your head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you still liked it, though. <laughs> I, I, I liked working there. I, I mean, I listen. I I tell the story a lot that here I was doing mom and pop small time stuff with the Crockets, and by uh, a few months later, I was doing uh, Lord Alfred Hayes and I were doing the commentary for Madison Square Garden. Mm-hmm. Did your money shoot up? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an easy family yeah. decision, too, right. right? But then uh, my wife didn't like w- living in Connecticut. It was tough. Mm-hmm. Connecticut's very, very expensive. Um, and, uh, well, I from the South, right? Most places are more expensive than the South. Right. So, and she was, she's lived in the South her, her entire life, basically. So it was, it was tough. And it was one of those, I, I, I remember taking a, a legal pad and writing pros and cons of the wow. movie and studying it and thinking about it and finally making the decision. It was very, it was a very, very tough decision to make. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know who knows i mean i i got to work for the braves yeah got to land here yeah doing you know working with tony khan and uh it all kind of worked out tony khan brought he uh he you know of course he remembers everything right yeah everything so he brought up we did our unrestricted podcast with him one time and he said so now he said now you say that the biggest regret you have was leaving the wwe he said, if you hadn't left the WWE, you'd never be here. Sure. And I'm thinking, damn, he remembers me saying that. And I don't know where he remembers me saying it <laughs> right, from. Yeah. Okay. But, but it's it's stored up there. It's stored up there. But it's true, though, yeah. right? Like all these, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily a higher power guy, but I do believe that the paths we take, and if you hadn't yeah. taken this one, and it's... yeah. You know, it's pretty wild that, yeah. and what a great, I'd assume what a, you know, what a great gig this is for you. Oh, Probably the it's best. The best. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't, you can't beat, uh, you, you can't put a price tag on being able to work for good people. Right. Mm-hmm. And as you probably know as well as anyone, of there's a lot of people who are not good in this business mm-hmm. you know, through the years. And, and this path has also helped me, uh, get a gig with the Georgia Bulldogs. Get out of here. Doing yeah. what? I do. I'm their producer. I'm their, uh, onsite producer for basketball and football. Tony Khan told me, he said, if, he said, I still want you to work for us, and you can still do Georgia. So I still do Georgia football. Great. And I've been doing it for 13 years now. And I uh, I really, really enjoy it. I, I enjoy our broadcast team. I enjoy uh, – and and most people say, Shivani's the voice of the Georgia Bulldogs. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I do some interviews. Yeah. But basically, I, I set up the equipment, make sure, they, uh, make sure they hit their cues, make sure they read all the commercials, 
and I'm just kind of in charge of the broadcast, riding the levels that day. Can I, I really like it? Can I ask how old you are? Do you Me? talk about that? No, I, I'm 62. 62. Yeah. Like, what? What's your? Do you have it kind of like mapped out, like in a perfect world? What your? Yeah, die on the broadcast. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, no. I mean, right. And, I, and I, I, I jokingly say that if I do die on the broadcast during the autopsy, they're going to say, what are these footprints on his ass? And I'm going to say, it's Taz's. <laughs> you just stand on me right. until they get the body off and you'll do the broadcast. Uh, no. Yeah. I, I don't. Listen, I don't want to. I don't want to retire. I, I don't. You, I, you, you'll do this forever. If you yes, can. I'll okay. do it until they say you know we've had enough. Of yeah, it. yeah. Because so the big what, what was his name? Big what's who's the guy that you took over for? Oh, uh, Big Bill Ward. Till they build Big Big Bill Ward. Big Bill you. Ward me yeah, out. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I hope I can work behind the scenes. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, and which I kind of do anyway. But it's uh, you know I don't know how long I have, but uh, gosh. I mean, there's no like, okay, and then when I'm 70, we'll retire to Florida or something no, like that. No, that's not, that's not it. There was a, uh, there was a guy that uh, I worked in the uh, International League for many years with, with the Gwinnett Braves, and the Toledo Mudhens announcer, uh, just uh, one of the great guys of all time. And uh, I was talking to him one day, and there was an article read. He started doing Mudhen games. And he's still doing mud hen games. He started doing mud hen games when I was a sophomore in high school. Okay? So he's old. Mm -hmm. Okay? And he still does them. They asked him one day, when are you going to retire? And he said, retire from what? Watching a baseball game? Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah that's true. Yeah, that's right. That's funny. So what am I going to retire from? Watching wrestling? I right. Mean, that's, I love it. Retire to then go home and, and turn on the TV and watch wrestling. Watch right, yeah. wrestling. Right. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of but sense. But I know there's going to become a day when, when I'm not going to be and I don't think it is right now. I'm, I'm not going to be as sharp. I mean, it happens to everybody, right? Mm. Uh, to wrestlers physically, to announcers, you know. Uh, I'm just not going to be sharp, and it's time to let somebody else. But until Tony Khan says, we don't want to use you, I'm just going to I'm going to keep trying to be a part of it. I love it. Yeah, I do too, man. Cool, man. This is a good yeah. talk. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was great talking with you. Yeah, great talking to you. Yeah, I'm so glad you're with us. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. We're having a great time. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tony Schiavone is on Twitter and Instagram at Tony Schiavone 24. His podcast is called What Happened When? It comes out every Wednesday morning at 6.05 a.m. Eastern. It has both a Facebook and a Patreon, WHW Monday. Okay, friends, that is the end for this season. The goal was always to grab batches on independent shows with different names and different people. And circumstances have led me to only be around the AEW folks. I hope it changes. The problem with me is I'm very focused on not being around anybody, wearing masks, quarantining. I have been invited to do independent shows. I just don't want to, which is crazy for me. The ultimate hustler, the ultimate hustler to say that I don't want to do shows, but I'd rather live into my elderly years and take a chance or make an elder die because of me or a friend or whatever it may be. So this is what we have. I hope to do more stuff in the future. I do have some pitches to the AEW team to do some kind of different AEW strategies and podcasts. I'll cross my fingers about that. But this is the end of the season. Uh, before we do go, I would like to tell you about some plugs and upcoming events. All the past archives are ad-free at patreon.com slash Colt Cabana. For a dollar more, you can get full Instagram live call-in shows, never-before-seen Colt Cabana content, Let's Watch Wrestling, Art of Wrestling live videos, and I just put up a new pilot that myself and John Hastings did called Teach Me Something I Forgot to Learn. It was I'm Dumb, but I've changed the name of the title to be more neurodiverse. Twitch.tv slash Cold Cabana. I am on there all the time playing wrestling jackbox games, AEW Among Us, and more with the code Colt25. Grab 25% off merch. ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok are all at Colt Cabana. ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. That's where you can hit me up for shows, conventions, business, or non-business stuff. Or you can send me something fun to my P.O. Box, which can be found at the bottom of my website, ColtCabana.com. Com. Upcoming events, 
Come on down to Jacksonville. We got safe tickets, safe seats, safe wrestling. If you want to watch it live, alleliteWrestling.com. Intro music is by the Ukulele Teacher on YouTube. Outro music by Super Fun, Yeah Yeah Rocket Ship. Podcast cover art designed by Jimmy Lee. Photo is by James Musclewhite. Huge thank you to our sponsors, Magic Spoon and BlueChew.com. Use the code Colt for both of those. And let's thank OneHourTees.com. They help run ProWrestlingTees.com. That's where you can buy all of my shirts, including the greatest Hanukkah slash menorah shirt of all time. Go check that out. I was very proud of it. ProWrestlingTees.com slash Colt Cabana. And I'd love to thank my Patreons at the $10 tier. You help all of this go. Brand new is Raj. There's Ingmar, Elizabeth Jack, Sasha Jade, Logan, Hold the Line Harry, Lee Fitz, Joey Carr, Jocelyn, Maureen, the free pile picker upper, Aaron Wood, Molly J, Stacy, Kimmy B, Ernie P, Jeremy Kaz, Adam Ho, Jimmy Legs, Caleb Nix, Tristan, Joshy C, Tabitha T, Jay Baca, Ismail, Jesse Coles, Mary Kate, Jimmy Anderson, Matt with one T, Sammy Wise, Mikey Mro, Freddy Sather, Nash, Gut Pocket, Stevie Straw, Vicken, Anthony Coco, Nick Chedic, Arlen, I made myself laugh on that one, Deanie Weemy, I mean, that's, I was more proud of Deanie Weemy, whose name is Dean Weems. <laughs> Uh, Davey Mart, Joe Sandy, Jimmy James, Johnny Wrong, which I think is John Wright, which I'm proud of that one too. Tom Lanza, David, Jeff Kem, Johnny Font, Cody Cliff, Nikki Nels, Juan Corrado, and McGinnis, Chris Miggs, Nigel, Adam Farr, Tommy Q, Sam the Drifter, The Scott Man, Ed Tells, Justin Erie, Rudy Boy, Joe Mills, Caleb South, Maria, Aaron Scarps, Vicka Mills, Christine Baylor, Morag and Scotty B. I took liberties with some nicknames. Nobody gave me any shit. One person said, oh, I've never heard my name said that way, but Colt, if you want to say my name that way, say my name that way, and I'm saying your name that way. So thank you for giving $10 a month. You know it means the world to me. This is just a bonus to give you a little love on the end of it. I appreciate it. For the season, this has been the Art of Wrestling. For Colt Cabana, I'm Colt Cabana. Thanks.